I'm so glad that you're able to be with us today. My name is Robert Gorell, and I'm the senior minister at Centenary United Methodist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma. And we have a series that we're going to be doing, studying together. It's called Coping as Christians. It's based on a workbook by a wonderful Methodist minister, Maxie Dunham. Uh, Maxie's retired now, but I've known him over the years, and I've used a lot of his material. Uh, this particular study I've done several times, and I find it to be very powerful. Uh, in, in light of the situation we're in right now, I think this is a perfect series because it, it helps us understand how we use our faith to meet the challenges of our world, especially the negative ones. Uh, you're welcome to buy the book, Coping as Christians by Maxie Dunham. But if you don't have that book, don't worry. All you need is your Bible and uh, some paper and a pencil. We will do a couple of things today where you'll need to write. So if you don't have those things ready right now, why don't you pause for just a moment and, uh, and get a Bible, get some paper, and get a pencil. And then uh, hit play and rejoin us. I hope all of us are here now and we're ready. Uh, this is a six-week course with study for every single day. And what I'm going to do is break that down and present about two or three days at a time for you, the highlights of two or three days at a time. So if you are following in the book, we'll be doing the first three days. This Today is what we'll be studying. Um, and then I just think that if you have that opportunity afterwards, uh, take a few moments and discuss the study questions with, uh, with someone in your family or call a friend and invite them to watch this as well. And then afterwards, uh, you, can, you can have social distancing, you can get on the phone, and you can chat about your responses to this study. I hope that you'll invite others to join us as the Centenary family as we begin this study. There's a wonderful story about Leonardo da Vinci as he was painting his, uh, his famous painting of The Last Supper. He had completed everything except the face of Jesus. And that just troubled him. He could just not get that face in his mind. And so finally he prepared himself with a night of, of prayer. And, and then he got up the, the, the morning, in the morning and he, and he went to, to finish the painting. And he had one of his assistants read the story of the Last Supper for him uh, out of the Bible. And as that assistant was reading, uh, an image began to coalesce in Leonardo da Vinci's mind uh, of, of what the face of Jesus should be. And just as he was starting to paint that face, two more of his young assistants ran in uh, yelling for him, saying, Master, Master, we've just come from the Duchess's house. There's an emergency. You have to come. And, and he knew he was on that that, that perfect image of Jesus for the, for the Last Supper. And he said, no, 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 I'll, I'll come later. And they said, no, Master, you must come now. The Duchess has ordered us to bring you back immediately. And uh, Da Vinci resists some more and says, no, I'm right in the middle of this. I, I have the image. I've been waiting for months for this moment. And the young assistants continue to uh, insist that he come to the Duchess for an emergency. Finally, Leonardo loses the image that he had in his mind of Jesus' face, and he, he sets down his paints, and he asks his assistants, what is the emergency? And they look at him, and, and with the energy of, of, of their position and being ordered to him by the Duchess, they say, oh, it's terrible. The tub in the Duchess's bathroom won't drain. Da Vinci sighed a deep sigh, <laughs> put away his paints for another several weeks, and became a plumber. Now we all have those things in our life that, that interrupt what we're doing. And, and sometimes those interruptions are, are so big, they sort of take our life right off of the track we're on. Uh, we feel like we, we lose something valuable when those interruptions come. And, and sometimes we, we experience grief about that or, or pain or, or anger uh, because we felt like we were close to doing something, completing something, or taking care of something important in our life, and, and now it's all been broken down by interruption. Um, over the past few days, we've all experienced a, a gigantic interruption in our lives. Things have, have changed for us. And so for this lesson today, we're gonna look at how you deal 
with that kind of an interruption. The great poet Robert Browning wrote, Just when we are safest, there's a sunset touch, someone's death, a chorus ending from Euripides, and that's enough for 50 hopes and fears. Browning is writing about those profound interruptions in our life that that, that cause everything to stop and, and cause us to, to reevaluate uh, who we are and how we're living. So I'd like to invite you to think about this question. What are the serious interruptions you're dealing with in your life right now? What are the serious interruptions you're dealing with in your life right now? Take a couple of moments and jot that down on your paper or in your notebook. What are the serious interruptions in your life you're dealing with right now? Is it work? Is it time together with family? Is it uh, canceling a trip or a vacation? Maybe it's even some kind of medical treatment you were hoping to have that, that's been interrupted. Just make a short list of the those things that have affected you in the deepest way. And think about those, those serious interruptions. And as you look at that list, then, then just, just write down a couple of feelings you have about those interruptions. Were you sad? Were you angry? Were you frustrated or confused? How do you feel about those big interruptions in your life. Now, Jesus dealt with interruptions. We're going to be looking at text today from the Gospel of Mark. So if you have your Bible, just turn over to Mark right now. Um, I wanted to use Mark because Pastor Matt and I had been preaching from the Gospel of Mark this, uh, this whole year. And, uh, and you'll be familiar with these stories. But I think they're so helpful. As we think about this first story that comes from Mark 6, 30 through 34, uh, it's important to remember that in Jesus' culture, there was this concept of Sabbath. It's really, really important concept, and it, 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 it springs branches into our Christian faith. There was this concept that, that, that there was a, a, a time you should take in your life to just focus on your relationship with God. It was, it was supposed to be a time you, you stopped laboring and working. Uh, it, was a, it was a witness for Jewish people to be able to say, our God is so good to us, we don't have to work seven days a week. He'll take care of us. We could spend one whole uh, period of a day just focused on our relationship with God. When I was a young pastor, I, I was an associate pastor at a church in Dallas. And Dallas still had the blue laws, what we call blue laws. They were on Sunday, only certain things, uh, only certain businesses were open, and you could only buy food and medicine. And I remember my first Sunday there, I was in charge of youth, and I ran down to Target to buy a kickball to play a game with the youth. And I grabbed it and I walked up to the counter, and the clerk looked at me like I was from another planet. And she said, You can't buy that. I said, Why not? Is it because I'm, I'm from Oklahoma? What's the deal? And she explained the blue laws to me. And I found that so irritating at first. But I have to say, uh, three and a half years later, when I moved back to Oklahoma, we didn't have blue laws in Oklahoma. I really missed it. Uh, I missed that, that there was that time of the week when the whole city seemed to slow down and take a deep breath. So that's a part of what's behind the concept of this story. I'll read the words to you from Mark 6, 30-34. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and let's get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot through all of the towns and got ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many 
things. So, so here's the image in Mark. Uh, Jesus has, has been ministering constantly. His disciples have just returned from their first missionary journey. They're gathered together and, and they're exhausted physically and spiritually. And the, the, the concept of Sabbath is weighing on his shoulders. And, uh, and he wants to demonstrate that to his disciples. He wants to go and, and, and have a time of quiet reflection and, 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 and maintain and grow his relationship with his heavenly Father. And he wants to, to create a situation where his disciples can do the same thing. But he's in such demand, even though he's in a boat and he's sailing across the Sea of Galilee, the people follow along the shore. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is not very big. It's like, it's like a, a lake. It's not as big as most Oklahoma lakes. Very easy for the people to follow along the shore. And when they land, the people are there and they, they have all of their wants and all of their needs. And Jesus knows his need for rest and spiritual regeneration. There are examples in the Bible throughout the Gospels of Jesus taking that time away, away from the crowds, to, to replenish himself spiritually. But this time is different. This time Jesus looks at the crowd and to him they're, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're vulnerable. They're in need. And so instead of taking his rest time and his Sabbath time, he ministers to the people there. So part of what we want to learn from Jesus is really uh, how do we integrate interruptions? Uh, how do we judge how to respond to different interruptions? Um, for example, if, if, if on Sunday morning you're getting up and you're saying, I just need to work harder, I need to make a few more bucks this week so, so I can buy a bigger car or, or a nicer lake cabin, that would be in violation of the concept of Sabbath in Scripture. But if you get up on Sunday morning and you're getting dressed and you're ready to go to Sunday school and church, and you notice your seven-year-old has all the symptoms of an appendicitis, well, you load him up in the car and you get him to the hospital with the pastor's blessing, I might add. So how do you, how do you sort that out and know uh, what are the interruptions that, that you need to push aside and what are those interruptions that you need to embrace and, and allow, to, allow them to reshape the direction of your life? Well, we take the lesson from Jesus, and, and this is a really important concept to get hold of. Jesus had a purpose, and he was very clear about that purpose. If you know your purpose in life, and if you are clear about your purpose in life, then that will become the compass that guides you through the interruptions that come your way. If you know your purpose and you're clear about your purpose, you'll know how to handle those interruptions. Calvin Miller, a wonderful uh, minister from Oklahoma, uh, tells a, a, a cute little story in a book he calls The Philippian Fragment. It's a, it, it's a supposedly found book of the Bible. It's, it's very clever and funny. And it's about the pastor at the church at Philippi long ago, all fiction, and yet with a lot of truth underlying it. And in one of the stories in the Philippian fragment, the pastor is on his way to church on Sunday morning, ready to preach. He's got his sermon worked up. He knows there are people in the congregation that need to hear the word that he's bringing that day. But one of his parishioners stops him and tells him there's a lady in the church who's dying. That in fact, this is probably her last hour on earth. And so the young pastor from Philippi has to decide. Does he go to the church to deliver the sermon? Or does he go and spend his time at, at the bedside of this woman who's dying? And this young pastor makes the decision to go and, and to be with the dying woman that morning. Afterwards, he gets a lot of criticism for the decision he's made. But he's okay with it because he knows his purpose and he's clear about it. So I invite you this morning, to, or this today, whenever you're, you're, you're doing this study, to take a moment and, and, and ask yourself, maybe write a few notes on your, 
on your paper in your notebook. What is my purpose in life? What is it that, that God has created me and called me to do? I know that's a big question, but it's something we really ought to know and something we need to be clear about. What is my purpose? Is it clear to me? Now I'm going to invite you to do a little exercise. So if you have a piece of paper, uh, I want you to create three columns there on your paper. On the first column, uh, the heading is interruption. The second column, the heading is response. And the third column is headed by feeling. I want you to pull out a couple of those interruptions you listed earlier, or maybe now you've you thought of a couple more and put them in the interruption column. And then when you after you do that, move over to the response column and, and write down how you responded to each of those interruptions. And if you need a little time, you can always hit pause and, and then when you're ready, hit play again. And when you've listed the interruptions, and you've listed the responses and maybe talked about that if you're with your family, then go to that third column and simply record how you felt about the interruption and the way you responded. Don't try to list all of the interruptions. That, that may get confusing. Just list two or three of them. And then how you responded and how you felt about that response. When you finish that, take a look at, at what you've put up there on that little chart and ask yourself, if I was clearer in my purpose, would I have handled the interruption differently? If I was clearer in my purpose, would I have handled the interruption differently. You might simply put yes or no, or you might want to might want to fill that out a little bit about about maybe how you might have handled it differently if you had focused on your purpose. Jesus' purpose was to to bring salvation, hope, and healing to the world, and because he was clear about that purpose, he knew when it was time to turn away and. And, and to leave the interruption behind. And he also knew when it was time to engage the interruption and use it as an opportunity to fulfill his purpose. Let's look at one more passage from the Bible. Now we're back in Mark 5, 21 through 34. And I invite you to think about this story. It, it comes before the previous story, and it's a story that most of you will be very familiar with. It's about Jesus, and he's, he's asked to heal a dying child, the daughter of Jairus. And so Jesus agrees to go to her house to heal her. But along the way, he's interrupted. You remember the beautiful story of, uh, of the woman who had been sick for so many years, and, and she believed if she could just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, she would be healed. And so she reaches out and touches it, and immediately Jesus knows something has happened. And he asks, who, who touched my garment? And his disciples say, why would you ask that? We're surrounded by dozens of people pressing against us. Why would that be such a big deal? But Jesus wants to know, because he wants to know the woman. In Israel, when we go to Israel, we go to the Sea of Galilee, we go to the town of Magdala, where Mary Magdalene came from. And there's a beautiful chapel there. You go down in the basement of the chapel and there are the stone road. It's built right there over the stone road where Jesus and his disciples once walked. The room is round and surrounding the room is a mural. It's just a mural of feet. Feet from the time of Jesus in sandals and you can see the bottoms of the robes. And there's a hand reaching up touching the hem of a garment, the woman who touched Jesus. Jesus stops, 
praises this woman for her faith and brings her healing. Even though he's on the way to heal a dying child. In fact, the child will die before Jesus gets there, although he will eventually raise that child from the dead. Jesus' purpose is clear, and he knows how to deal with the interruption because of that person, because of that purpose. Jesus knew that people were of ultimate importance. That's what mattered most to him. And I invite you to take a moment and think about if people were of ultimate importance in my life, how would that change the way I deal with interruptions? Think about that list of, of interruptions you had. And for many of us, the top thing on that list is going to be the COVID virus. Think about that list. And if, if I make people of ultimate importance, uh, serving them the way that Christ calls me to serve them, how is that going to change the way I respond to this interruption in my life? Maxie Dunham, in, in his book, Coping as Christians, tells the story of a, of a pastor friend of his named Skid. And Skid, by all accounts, was an incredible pastor, just wonderful, beloved by his people, um, recognized and loved by the other pastors. Even it was an inspiration to them. And Maxie says that when Skid was 51, he found out that he had incurable cancer, that his life would soon end. And of course, Skid's family and friends were, were just heartbroken and shattered uh, by the diagnosis. But Maxie said it was very interesting to watch Skid, this, this pastor who at 51 knew his life was coming to an end. He, he said he watched his friend and Skid continued to minister to people continued to, to focus on, on people in, in the way that, that Jesus would. And finally, Maxie just had to ask his friend Skid, he said, what, what is it? How are you able to do this? You've had the greatest interruption in life itself, an incurable illness, and yet you're focused on people and ministering to them and caring for them. And Skid had this beautiful line, to each person I meet, I can give all that I have in the moments we are together. Isn't that amazing? That's so powerful to me. To each person I meet, I can give all that I have in the moments we have together. I want to invite you to think of that list of interruptions. You may have even written down somebody's name who interrupts you a lot or a situation. Would you handle them any differently if you made people the ultimate value in your life? Would you handle those interruptions differently if you recognize that, that we just have moments together? And what we do in those moments defines who we are as human beings and as followers of Christ. And so until our next lesson, I'd like to ask you to make this commitment. Make the commitment that to each person I meet, I will give all I have in the moments we have together. God bless you. We're praying for you. Pray for one another. And we'll see you in lesson two.